Sit down and greet somebody next to you. Give it up for Chino Valley for sharing some amazing worship with us tonight. Thank you guys. It's awesome. Blessings, blessings, blessings. Man, it is so good to see all of you here. I want to tell you something, man. Um, my pastor, uh, he follows in the footsteps of his pastor. And one of the principles of Calvary Chapel has always been that you faithfully teach the word and you love the sheep and make them feel, that, you know, let the, they're the best fed and, and best taught and most loved sheep. And you know what? We, we get nothing but love from you guys. And we, we thank you for coming here every night. It's been an amazing week, hasn't it, so far? It's been really cool to have you guys here. We had uh, Monday night, uh, actually Friday, uh, Sunday with Pastor Raw, and he started off on Palm Sunday. Then we had Sean on Monday, and uh, he did an amazing job. Then we had Wade teaching on the day of argument. We had Dale last night on the cleansing. And tonight here, we're going to continue with our journey through this Passion Week, and we're going to reflect on... Um, the day of the ultimate surrender. The day of ultimate surrender. You know, um, I'm super nervous. I'm going to tell you I'm nervous. Um, I have to follow Wade and Sean and Pastor Dale and Rawls tomorrow. It's like, can you imagine like being stuck in between like Aaron and Moses and having to speak? It's like, and then I'm walking back, you know, and, and, and there's always somebody that wants to say something nice. And, hey, Pastor Scott, are you speaking tonight? Yeah, I'm going to pray for him. You're like, hey, that's cool. Hey, I like those pants. I'm like, thanks. And they're like, are they your wife's? I'm like, no, they're my sons, okay? Just so you know that. So I had to clarify that. They're my sons. All right. If you guys have your Bible, open up to the book of Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. And we're going to start in verse 36. Matthew 26, 36. And did I say 30? I said 36, right? Not 26. 36. Here we go. The prayer in the garden. So as we're continuing here, uh, Jesus came, and it says, verse 36, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. This place of Gethsemane, the meaning of this name in the Aramaic is translated a place or the estate of the olive press. It is located on the base of the Mount of Olives. It is a place of great personal importance to Jesus. It is mentioned in all four of the Gospels. And it was a special place where Jesus retreated into deep prayer and communion with his Father. And at this particular time, he is agonizing and wrestling with great sorrow over the torture and the humiliation that is getting ready to come his way. He knew, he knew that his time was coming. His time was at hand, literally. The time of his arrest and the time of his crucifixion. This garden was a place where olives were crushed. An olive press is pretty much an olive press. They put all the olives into this thing and they use a heavy stone or, or some kind of a mechanism. And what it does is it crushes the oil so it would get the oil out of it. And, and you guys know if you cook with olive oil, it's an amazing. And when you go to Israel and you taste their olive oil, it's second to none. It's beautiful. It's wonderful tasting. They use it for anointing. They would use it for a lot of the spices in their food. They would use it for uh, the temple implements. And it was a very important uh, part of the temple worship, especially for the Jews. They would use it for their lamps to light their fires. And as these olives were being pressed in this garden, it is fitting that Jesus also would enter into this garden for he himself would be pressed and literally be poured out as he's getting ready to go to the cross the next day. You know, I was talking to Pastor Larry earlier in the week and one of his Bible students in the, in the Bible college came up with a great analogy that I'm, I'm stealing right now. I'm gonna tell you what they came up with. It was amazing. They came up with like the temple, uh, the, the, the tabernacle, very similar to the garden of Gethsemane. And if you think about it, it's true, because what he went, he only went with three guys. He went with Peter, he went with James, he went with John. And as he's going into this, this holy place, he tells them, you stay here and wait. And then he goes into the holiest of holies, where he himself enters into this time of prayer with his heavenly father. And we know from the story, and we're going to cover it in great detail, he does this a couple of times. And it was in the latter part of the evening, I'm sure there was a lot going on during this time in the ministry of Jesus, and the disciples, as you guys know, their eyes begin to get heavy, and they begin to literally fall asleep. I don't know if you've ever 
had that happen to you, but I've seen some of you guys fall asleep during worst. I'm not lying. We have a big screen back there, and we'll always like, look at this guy. You know, look at that. But you know what we also see all the time, and it's a beautiful thing, is when Rawl sits back there and he just shakes his head. He shakes his head, and he's in amazement that God brings the people every week. It's so cool to watch. He's like a little kid at a fair. He's like, it's amazing. Where did they, where did they all come from? I'm like... And he's so amazed as, as the first day he ever taught the word, even till now, he's blown away at what God has done through Calvary Chapel Golden Springs. And one of the most beautiful things, and we are just back there right now, is watching you worship is awesome. It really is something special. You don't know you're being watched, not by us, but God is watching. And you're raising your hands. Some of you, there's tears streaming down your face. So your hands are lifted up. Some of you guys are like this. It's okay, you're gonna get saved tonight, it's okay. <laughs> but it is a beautiful thing to watch God's people respond to the moving of his Holy Spirit. It is just amazing. It's not something, it's like we don't put these little signs and say, okay, and applause now, and raise your hands, and cry. We don't have the cues up there, right? It's not on cue, it's just like this is what God does when he's moving through the hearts of his people. And the beautiful thing about worship, but we get calls at the front desk all the time. Yeah, what time are your church services? Uh, 8, 10, and 12. No, what time does the church start? 8, 10, and 12. No, I mean, when's the music over? <laughs> yeah, we get it all the time. And I go, they, they must be thinking it's a movie or something, right? They don't understand the importance of what worship is. It's like if you went to, into your garden and you just took the seeds and threw it down in the dirt and watched and said, wait for it to grow. It doesn't work, does it? You have to cultivate that ground, right? You have to break up that hard soil. Then you throw the seeds in there, and then you water it, and then the seed begins to grow. That's what worship is. Now, worship is just not with a guitar. It's not with a keyboard and drums. It's an attitude of the heart, is it not? And let's all be honest. When we're coming to church sometimes, we're not in the best spirit as we're trying to get here on time with 16 kids, are we? Or trying to get through that parking lot out there and somebody's cutting you off and you're like, <laughs> praise you. <laughs> praise you, right? You know exactly what I'm talking about. You're trying to be in the spear, but you're, the flesh is just sticking out your collar right there. You're like, ugh. But then you get in here and we put on the Jesus face. I praise you. <laughs> Everybody, right? Everybody's saved. But the truth is, it's a beautiful thing to be in the house of God. This garden symbolizes the temple. It was really cool. It was a holy place. He told the disciples to wait there, to watch and to pray. They could not go where he was going. They couldn't go in the physical temple, in, in, in the tabernacle, because only the high priest could go behind that curtain of the holiest of holies. And it was a place where he was going to lay, literally lay down his life. He was getting ready to submit to one of the greatest feats that has ever been done. Only he could go into this holy place as a high priest and the perfect lamb of God. Let's talk about his disciples. We already know Peter, right? Peter is the typology of all of us here. Right? The duality of Peter, the duality of man. He can be so spiritual and, like I said in the parking lot, be so carnal at the exact same time, right? Oh, God, it is good that we are here. I'm so glad that we're here. Let's build three tabernacles. Jesus, like, you're so dumb. Like, Jesus, I love you so much that even if all these guys betray you, not me, I'm super Peter. I will defend you. And Jesus looks at him, really? Before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Nah, not me. And you remember, and we're going to talk about time, he gets out and he gets, tries to pull a Zorro on the guy and pulls the sword out and cuts the guy's ear off. The spiritual Peter, right? He is, he is the portrait of the church, the carnality and the spirituality all tied up into one. But I guarantee you, after this night, Peter changes. He's a different man. Read his epistles. Read in the book of Acts. He never falls asleep in prayer again after this night. Matter of fact, all of his encouragements in the book of Acts and all through his epistles are always continuing in prayer, steadfast in prayer. Pray without ceasing, just like Paul would say. He understood the importance of it, and we're going to get into that in a minute. You had Peter, you had James and John, the two sons. This is Jesus' Jesus's inner circle, his little posse. He had 12, but these are his three chosen ones. They were often with him in times, his little council. He brought them with him. He brought them there for confidence and for prayer and for support. But what he got, I think, was a little bit of disappointment. But I, I'll tell you what, he still loved him. He didn't hold it against him. It wasn't like he walked over and he's praying and they go and just kick him. Get up, you dummies. It wasn't one of those. It was just like he knew. He knew their humanity. He knew their weaknesses. 
He himself was going through his own physical weaknesses, his own personal human fear and terror and agony. He understood that human side. And he even told them three times, pray. Watch with me, sit, stay, and I want you to pray that you do not enter into temptation. And what did he mean? In other words, the temptation was not at that moment. It was afterwards when all of them would flee from him. He knew that they would all flee away. And still God had mercy on each one of them. Look what it says here. It says again in verse, um, verse 36. He says, again, he says, they, they came with him to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Second time he says it. And he went a little farther, and he fell on his face praying, saying, oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. I love this here. He's telling them to literally, the first thing he says is stay. It means to sit. It means to wait. It means to tarry. It's in a place of observant, almost like you're, you're like a guard on a tower. I want you to watch. He knew they were coming to betray him. He knew they were coming. But there was something that he needed to do. He needed to spend time with his father and preparing his heart before he would go that next day to the cross. He was trying to teach them something about faith and true strength, that their strength was not in their ability to, to yield the sword or their ability to defend Jesus, but their ability to pray as one. I think one of the biggest weaknesses in the church today, and I don't mean in our church, but partially all the churches is we talk about prayer more than we do it. I could prove the point. If the church prayed... We wouldn't have so much division in our government and our policies today. We wouldn't have the chaos on our southern and northern borders. We wouldn't have all the division in politics, all the crime that is going on, all the insane sin and stuff that's happening. We would not have that if the church prayed in unity, if the church prayed for changed lives, if the, if the church prayed for revival, and I don't mean on a global level, I mean revival starts, and Rawl came up with this phrase a long time, where re revival begins in the heart of one person at a time. As one person gets revived and renewed, then he spreads it to the next person and to the next person, and before you know it, an entire household, then an entire city, and then an entire town, entire country, and we can see a revival all over the place, if we, like the word of God says, if my people who are called by my name will turn from their wicked ways and pray, I will hear them from heaven and I will heal their land. And I, I paraphrase that loosely, but you get the idea. He says, if my people who are supposed to be called by my name would do exactly what I tell them to do, would just seek my face, when you seek God's face, he begins to show you what you should and should not do, and you flee from sin, and God begins to do a new work in and through us. But it's not until we first learn to surrender our own will, our own flesh, our own desires, our own agenda, and when that happens, then we start to see real life, real victory. And we're going to get into that in a moment. Stay here, he says. Sit, wait, tarry. Then he says watch. The word watch means to keep a vigil or to observe or to oversee. He knew they were coming. They weren't going to stop him from coming, but give him a little bit of warning. Just watch. And the last thing he says is to pray. The word prayer here, there's, mul there's multiple meanings to the word prayer. We're going to cover a few of them. In this particular one, he's talking about making a request, a petition, an appeal, or intercession. This is the kind of prayer that he wanted them, pray for intercession, pray for me. I'm going through it right now. I don't know if you pray for your pastor and pray for Sharon right now. They need your prayers more than ever before. They're in an interesting place in their life right now. And you know what? And God is beside them and God is lifting them and God is strengthening them and God is directing them. But it doesn't make it any easier to be a pastor of a church this size and, and the person that he loves the most on this earth is, is suffering from a sickness. And God has been her strength, and he has literally bore her up, and he has been her strength every day. But the truth is, she's suffering in so many ways, and she needs and covets your prayers. I pray that you would pray for your pastor 
and for his wife. They need it right now, especially for the future of the church. As the Lord continues to, to, continues to lead and guide him, he needs more wisdom now than ever before. And we need your prayers. We need your prayers on how we could effectively lift his hands and better serve you as the people of this church. That's what we live for. We live to serve you. That's what we do. We don't need a pat on the back. We don't need, your, you know, more tithing. That's not what we need. We just need your prayers. I, matter of fact, stop giving and start praying. We have more money than you could ever give. Just start praying more. Pray for your church. Pray for the country. Pray for your pastors. Pray for the leaders. Pray for people in office. Yes, pray for Gavin Newsom. Pray for that guy. Can't even do it without gritting my teeth. Anyway, here's the different types of prayer. Prayers of adoration. There's prayers of confession. Prayers of supplication, which means like a humble request. Of course, intercession means when you're praying and you're standing in the gap for other people. There's lamentation when you're just, you're just sorrowful and you're mourning. When you're praying for something that's just broken your heart over sin or somebody that's going through something, that's called a lamentation. And, of course, there's prayers of repentance and prayers of thanksgiving. Those are just a few. He warned them that the lack of vigilant prayer would lead them to temptation and eventually sin. I like what he says right here. He says, my soul, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch and pray. He's saying, this is what I'm going through. I need you to pray for me. And then later on, he literally says, he says it right here in verse, um, in verse 40. Then he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping. He said, Peter, what? Could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is, you know how often we use that, right? We use that at the gym all the time. Spirit's willing, brother, but the flesh is weak. You know, that's not that. Think about how often you want to get up and spend time with God. You're like, oh, but I'm so tired. Just push that snooze button one more time, right? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Do you believe that God puts it on your heart to spend time with him? Yes. But the flesh has to be aligned with the spirit. And if it's not, you will do just the opposite. Somebody asked me, how do I know if I'm doing the will of God? I tell them all the time. It's super easy. Just do the opposite of what you want to do, and you'll be obeying God. <laughs> like, that's such wisdom. I'm like, no, that's just humanity. That's just humanity. You want to be a good kid? Obey your parents. No, that's hard. They asked me to do impossible things like clean, <laughs> put things back. Yeah, Right? Do the opposite of what you want, and you'll automatically be doing what God wants, and you will have peace. They're like, no, no, it can't be that easy. The Bible tells us that it is. Well, we make it so difficult. He says this. He says, he warned them. Again, in Colossians 4, 2, he says, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, he says, this is Paul saying, pray without ceasing. What does that mean to be praying without ceasing? Does it mean that we're always to be going around praying all the time? Yes, it actually is. Uh, I was at the gym yesterday. I saw this couple, these two girls, and I was just watching them. And the Lord put this one girl on my heart. Just, I don't know why God put this discernment in my heart that she had been through something difficult and something really heavy. I, she was wearing it. And I don't usually approach people at the gym because that's weird. Like, hey, what's your name? That's weird. I literally said, I go, hey, uh, I called her over and uh, said, hey, what's your name? Why? <laughs> I, know, I know this is weird. My name is Scott. And she tells me her name. And I said, look, I don't know if you understand this, but sometimes God puts things on a person's heart to do. And if you don't do it, you're obedient. And the Lord told me to pray for you. And I'm going to commit this week to pray for you. She looked at me like, Whatever. Saw her again this morning. I just didn't make eye contact. I didn't want her to beat me up. But anyway, I, I have been praying for her all week. I don't know. I was praying for her before the service. Like, Lord, I don't know where she's at, what she's going through, what she's doing. But, Lord, touch her heart right now, right now, wherever she's at. Whatever, whatever pain she's got inside, Lord, heal it and bring her to the cross. This is the week that you can do it. This is the day that you can do it. And God's just been putting people on my heart. We were at in and out the other night. Me and my buddy just come from a, a campus, or not a study, it was a study at a hospital. And noticed the family walk in all dressed in black. And uh, their faces were kind of long. And I walked up to them and said, hey, did you guys just come from a funeral? And they said, yeah. I said, do you mind if I pray for you? And they're like, they looked at me like we're at an In-N-Out Burger, you know. 
And they said, please. And they just gathered over the whole family and just started praying over this family and watching the grandmother, you know, tears and the young man who lost. And it was just one of those moments, yeah? One of the girls that worked at In-N-Out, she was bringing the food to our table and me and my buddy were talking and I just, do you know Jesus? And she looked at me and she's like, you know what? I used to. And I said, well, what got in the way? And she looked at me and she said, life. And I said, life got in the way? I'm the, 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 the way the truth and the life got in the way of your life? I'm all, something got in the way. I go, hey. And I just looked her straight in the eyes. I said, Jesus loves you. He has a plan for your life. He's never left you or forsaken you. You left him, but he never left you. And he wants you to come back to him. And she just was looking at me and tears welling up in her eyes and she had to go back to work and it was just those moments, you know what I'm saying? Where you got to take advantage of those moments. Because you don't know at that moment that you're sharing that God puts that on your heart that that's the moment of surrender for that person. My buddy went to a, we were at a hospital, like I said, a retirement convalescent hospital. 14 elderly people gave their life to the Lord in one day. One day. Yeah, clap. Clap. Because some of you guys, that's your grandmother. Your grandfather, your mom that you forgot about that is sitting in that hospital in a wheelchair that nobody talks to, and God put it on my friend's heart to go over and start this study over there, and they opened the door to us. He got 14 people saved in one day, two of the nurses, and the next day, four more. And every Wednesday, we go back. And if you can remember to pray on Wednesdays for this place, because God is pouring his spirit out on all people. Because these people are at the end of their lives. They've forgot, most people have forgotten about them. They sit and they're waiting to go into eternity. We'll talk after. It's in Glendora. It's in Glendora. But I'll continue. Look what he says. He says this in 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant because your adversary. He told them to be vigilant. He told them to be sober literally means to be clear-minded. Because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a, like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. In this particular situation, when he came and found them sleeping, literally their flesh had overpowered their spiritual will. That's the same thing that happens when we fall into sin. Our flesh is overpowering the spirit. He found them sleeping three times. He rebuked them three times. Are you still sleeping? Are you still resting? And then he literally tells them that the hour has come. Look what he says. I like that he says, my, my, oh, my father, if this cup can pass away, for me, until I drink it, your will be done. He prays this three times too. You got to understand, Jesus was God. Jesus was man. Jesus grew up watching the Roman occupation, and he saw many crucifixions. It was a horrible death. It was a shameful death. It was a painful, suffering kind of death. It was so much that when Jesus is praying to the Father, he's literally asking him, Father, if there's any way for your will to be completed without me having to go to that cross, in other words, this cup of suffering that you've given me, if there's any way for me not to have to drink that cup then let it be done, but not according to my will, but according to your will. And he prays it three times. Do you think he was scared? Do you think he understood where he was getting ready to go? He did. I don't think we do half the time. You see the, the, the passion of the Christ, the movie, and you're like, wow, that was pretty gnarly. They said that they cut a half hour of, of film off of that because it was so graphic. It, it got a, a rated R already. Mel Gibson wanted to put more in there. He wanted to fully embrace the brutality of the crucifixion and what led up to it. But the, the producer said, people can't handle that. If you've ever watched it, it is already graphic. The book of Isaiah tells us how bad it was. It says that his visage, his image, in other words, his human form was so beat up the word marred literally means like when you take a piece of clay and then you just beat the piece of clay until it turns into something that you can't even recognize anymore. His image was so marred that you could not recognize him as a man. I used to be an EMT and a paramedic and I would watch coming up on 
accident scenes and I would see some of the most horrible things. One of the very first calls I ever went to was I had firefighters hand me a piece of cardboard and have me scoop up remains off of the freeway. You don't get, off, you don't get over that kind of thing, seeing that kind of stuff. But to see Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, coming down willingly and in this garden as he's having a moment of intimacy with the Father and he literally separates himself from his disciples for this moment and he's praying to the Father if there's any way, if there's any way for this cup to pass, please let it be done. But at the end of his sentence, he says, not my will, but thy will be done. This is the beginning of that ultimate surrender. You guys know what surrender actually means, right? It's a pretty heavy word. It's not just like, I give up. It's something way deeper than that. We see his passion right here in verse 37. Look what he says. Again, he says, and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to the point of death. Stay here and watch. And then again in this verse, he says, oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but you will. And then he came to the disciples, found them sleeping. Could you not watch with me an hour? lest you fall into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed as saying, oh my father, if this cup cannot pass from me unless I drink it, your will be done. He always says that. And he came and found them asleep again for their eyes were heavy and so he left them. He went away again and prayed the third time saying the same words and then he came to his disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. He was deeply distressed as we see this. The condition, although rare, and it tells us in the book of Luke, chapter 22, verse 44, it says, Then his sweat, his sweat become like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. I told you that this passage is covered in all the Gospels, but they all have little bits of pieces that are left out of the other ones. But when you read Luke, Dr. Luke, he talks about a particular kind of condition, literally called, it's called hemidrosis. Hemidrosis was basically means the capillaries under the skin, under great stress and duress, will burst, usually around the face and the chest, and the blood comes out of your pores. It's rare, but it does happen. I wrote this down. This occurs on any of the surface of the body. The face and the forehead are common locations that it generally occurs when a person feels intense fear or stress. For example, someone facing death may have this kind of fear or stress. When we are under stress, the body goes into a fight or flight mode. During this mode, the body releases chemicals, adrenaline, cortisol, etc., and they prepare to either fight or flee the danger. But in rare instances, the fight or flight response can trigger the rupture of capillaries in the body. These capillaries are tiny blood vessels located in our skin tissue. And they carry essential nutrients to the different parts of the body. Capillaries are also located around the sweat glands. And in cases of severe fear or stress, these tiny blood vessels can burst and cause blood to exit the bodies through the sweat glands. This is exactly what he suffered. Can you imagine being so stressed so burdened. It wasn't just the pain and the suffering and the torture that he was going to, that's not what, I don't believe that that was the full measure of what he was carrying. In his humanity, he was probably like, can I do this? Can I go through with this? I know that this is the reason why you sent me, Father. I know this is why I've come. I've come to set the captives free. I know this. But God, I'm scared. Father, I'm scared. And aren't we scared sometimes when God is calling us to face difficult situations? Do you know how scared it is to let go of an addiction that has controlled your life? Do you know how hard it is to walk away from a relationship when that relationship has become toxic and abusive and dangerous? 
Do you know how hard it is to cut the umbilical cord on a child when that child becomes unattainable? When you literally have to put that child on the altar and say, God, I can no longer help him. I can no longer help her. You've got to do this, God. When you've got to step out of situations and circumstances that you know are going to be difficult, leave a perfectly good job for God knows what reason, but God is telling you to leave, and you don't even have anything lined up, and God's telling you go. Those great sacrifices, those great things of surrender, when God is saying, do you trust me with your husband? Do you trust me with your wife? Stop preaching, start praying, and watch me do my work. Do you trust me with your children? Put them on the altar. All your preaching, all your asking, that's not going to save them. My Holy Spirit will save them. Surrender them to me. Do you know how hard that is to let go? You all know. To let go of pet sins, to let go of things that you don't think are controlling you. You think you have a hand on it. It could be a little bottle of pills that your doctor prescribes to you every week, and you find yourself a slave to it. And at the last pill, you can't wait to get a refill. You know what I'm talking about. Or when no one's around, you sneak off after work on the way home and hit that liquor store just to get a quick one before you go home. You know what I'm talking about. Or sneak off to go to the computer and just look up some garbage hoping no one's going to find you. God's telling you to surrender. It's not impossible. It is difficult because your flesh loves it. Your flesh likes it. He's saying, let go of it. His prayer, oh, my father. You notice here, when he says, oh, my father, he's talking about his relational intimacy with the father. It shows you how intimate he was with the father. If it is possible, he's recognizing God's sovereignty. I know you can do anything. If it's possible, you can change this, but let this cup pass me. His compassionate humanity, he felt as a human, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to go through this. If, there's, if this cup can pass away, then please let it be. And if I have to drink it, then okay. He asked his father three, three times that if there was any other way than the cross, then please allow that. If there was any other way for God's salvation plan to be met without the pain and the shame and the burden of the cross... At this moment, it was a clash of his human emotion and fear met by his divine omniscience and foreknowledge, his selfless submission to the will of his loving father, all crashing together in one moment in time that will set him on that lonely road to Calvary. Think about that. But then you see the surrender, nevertheless. After it's all said and done, not, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will, your will be done. This is where we get the absolute surrender. Where he surrenders his will. Think about what he already surrendered. He was at the right hand of the Father, co-creator in heaven, leaves heaven, comes down in the form of man. And the Bible says, did not consider it robbery to be, to be like that, right? To be like God. And yet he comes down in the form of man, a servant of man. Blasphemed beaten, hated, all of the above. He left everything that was precious to him to come down to save which is most precious to his father, you. He came down and did what no one else could. He surrendered his life so that you could have eternal life. Think about it. That's what sets Christians apart from every other faith and religion on this, on this planet. No one sacrifices themselves and then takes up their life again. And he does that to show them that he has power not only of this earth and of life and of death, but he has the power to give life to whoever chooses, whoever he chooses and whomever chooses him, he gives them eternal life. 
His testing, this testing brought God's assistance and strength as we know this because in Luke 22, 43, it says, and then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him as he prayed. The Bible says in Luke that an angel came down and began to strengthen him. The same angel that when he battled with Satan in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights after he hadn't eaten, remember? And after he had rebuked Satan three times with the word of God, the Bible says, and then angels came and ministered to him. His humanity. God sent his powerful angels down there to come and minister to Jesus. Here Jesus is completely relinquishing all control into the trusting hands of his loving father. In an example that we should strive to follow. What exactly is surrender? Surrender means to completely relinquish the possession or control of another. To submit to the power, the will, the authority, and the control of another. All things. Just, I give up. Jesus, having first surrendered himself to God, is then able to give himself sacrificially for God and for others. This example of surrender is seen in the single-minded devotion of Jesus who came to do the will of the one who sent him and to complete his work. John 4, 34, he said, and Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. The word finish, he, he, he says three times in his messages, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill or to finish it. He says it here. He also says it on the cross. It is, yeah. And what came at the end of that word finished? Period. Couldn't add to it, couldn't take it away. Everything that he said and everything he did was completed and fulfilled. And then he adds a little cherry on top, then he resurrects. Just a little extra dramatization. Oh, yeah, I laid my life down, but then I'm going to take it up again so that where I will be, you will be also. Death can't hold me down. Death can't hold you down. I told you I'm going away to prepare a place in my father's house so that where I go, you will be also. I wasn't lying. In my father's house, there are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. That's a beautiful thing. I love this. John, uh, excuse me, Jesus was secure in his God and resolute in his surrender. He wasn't about to change his mind or turn back. Once he set his mind, literally, it was like flint. Isaiah 50, verse 7, for the Lord God will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. This is the prophet Isaiah speaking about Jesus' decision to go to the cross. Once he set his mind to do the will of the Father, and it wasn't here. It was a long time before this. He knew that the path was the cross. Just like Paul knew that everywhere he went, because the Spirit testified that everywhere he went would be what? Chains and persecution was awaiting him. Jesus' single-minded devotion and commitment to the will of the Father was the result of his ultimate surrender, both of his own life and his personal will in order to serve the will of his heavenly Father and fulfill his plan for salvation. Without such surrender, there could be no sacrifice for our sins and therefore no place for redemption. Complete surrender always precedes the greatest sacrifice. Remember that. Complete surrender always precedes the greatest sacrifice. Surrender is the cause, and sacrifice is the effect. You cannot have the fruit without the root. You can't have one without the other. Philippians 2, verse 5 through 8 says this, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, Taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Ooh, there was none worse than that. Can you imagine? Naked, beaten, alone, nails driven through your hands and feet, your skin flayed off of your body, a crown of thorns pressed into your scalp and you're just out there hanging up on that cross before the whole world as they're jeering you and throwing things at you and spitting upon you and cursing you and you did nothing 
wrong. Remember what he says? The two thieves, one on one side, one on the other. Hey, you're the great physician. Save us and save yourselves. And the other one says, hey, we belong here. We've committed sins. We're worthy of this, but he has done nothing wrong. Master, when you go to be in your kingdom today, when you go to paradise, please remember me. He says, assuredly today you will be with me in paradise. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, right? But before that he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Even as he's hanging there, he's showing and pouring out his grace and the mercy till the very last breath. And then the Bible says, and he says, it is finished. And he breathed his last. Think about it. He became broken bread and poured out wine on that cross. Unbelievable. Let's never forget the great benefit of God's glory and kingdom that has come through the lives of thousands of people who have surrendered to the agenda beyond their own means. Some have gone in faraway lands as missionaries. Mothers have surrendered careers and opportunities for the significance to teach their own children. God's truth. Fathers have changed careers and turned down promotions and conflicted with God's will so that their families would be blessed. Pastors have faithfully served in out-of-the-way places where no one knows their names or asks them to speak at high-profile conferences. Why? All for the glory of God. All for the glory of God. Here we see in verse 47 now, they begin this betrayal. The betrayal and arrest. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the 12, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given him a sign saying, whoever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him immediately he went up to Jesus and said, greetings, rabbi. And then he kissed him. Pretty sick. Jesus chose this time right here to fulfill prophecy. In Matthew 26, 21, it says, he who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The son of man indeed goes, just as it is written of him, but woe to that man to whom the son of man is betrayed. It will be better for him that he had never been born. He prophesied of it. He wasn't the only one. In Psalm 41, 9, even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel. Literally, literally means he acted as a traitor against me. Psalm 55, 12 and 14, for it is not an enemy who reproaches me. If it was, then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me. Then I could hide from him. But verse 13 says, but it was you, a man my equal, my companion, my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together. Think about it. He spent time, three years with Jesus in his earthly ministry, watching the signs and the miracles and all the cool things. And yet he turned and betrayed Jesus. He says, and walked in the house of God in the throng. He was the treasurer and the thief. We know this because John 12, 5, 6 is why this was a fragrant oil, remember? Somebody gave this fragrant oil, broke it down all over, was anointing Jesus, and he looks at him and says, what a waste, and literally says this. Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. This is the kind of man that he was. He was possessed by Satan. We know this in Luke 22, verse 3. that says that when he made a deal, right before he went to go make a deal to betray Jesus, the Bible says that Satan entered into him and he went out and did what he did. He was a possessed man. And then he sold his soul, literally for 30. He sold out his soul and he sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. In Matthew 26, 15, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him into you, to your hand? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. They came with a multitude with swords and clubs. They, he said, whom are you seeking? They said, Jesus of Nazareth says, I am he. Whom? They all fell back. He said that phrase, I am. Just like in the book of Exodus, in that authority in which he spoke, they were just all thrown back. In Luke 22, it says, we see that Satan entered into Judas right before he went to conspire. 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces was the price paid for a master of a slave if when his slave was gored by an ox. Exodus chapter 31 talks about it. In order to compensate a master for a slave's death and burial, they were to be written 30 pieces of silver to cover the cost. Judas sold out Jesus for the price 
of a killed servant, a servant that was killed accidentally by a beast. And Zechariah 11, verses 4 through 14, he literally talks about it. And I don't want to read into it. It's too much. But literally, Zechariah takes, uh, takes on the job of, a, of a, a shepherd. And his only payment, 30 pieces of silver, taking care of God's sheep. And the sheep that he took care of, God says, these sheep are not my sheep. And he literally cast judgment on them. Zechariah says he got rid of these three shepherds doomed from the flock in verse 8. He's literally talking about the three groups of people that Jesus would deal with, the scribes, the Pharisees, and even the Old Testament prophets. These were all done away with after Jesus came on the scene. No longer were the prophets and the scribes and the Pharisees, they weren't the authority anymore. Jesus was the main authority. Then we see here Jesus and this mob. He responds to him, friend, why have you come? Jesus says, are you betraying the Son of Man? And Luke 20 says, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? He looks at him, even this. Do you permit even this? Think about it. This is, this is interesting. Jesus is standing in the garden praying for his disciples, praying for the Father, praying for the strength to go on. And his servant comes in and uses the greatest act of affection to perform the greatest act of betrayal with a kiss. And he looks at him and he says, you're going to betray me with a kiss? And this was a common theme when you had a teacher, someone you loved you, it was a, a sign of respect. And he used that as a sign to betray Jesus. And as soon as they kissed him, they laid hands on him and took him away. But not before Peter takes out his sword and he whacks one of the priest's servants in the right ear and literally lops his ear off. And he looks at Peter and says, would you permit this? Put your sword back in its sheath. He picks up the ear, he puts it back on the man, and he literally heals him right there in the garden. Don't you know that those who live by the sword will die by the sword? This was done so that the prophecy would be fulfilled. And don't you know, he says, don't you know that I have the power to call down 12 legions of angels, close to 72,000 angels. One angel overthrew 185,000 Assyrian troops. Can you imagine what 12 legions could do? He says, I have that kind of authority. I don't need you. He was showing them the authority that he had, but the authority that he kept at bay could you imagine if he just said, they would have all been dead? He spoke, I am, and they all fell back. Did he not have the power and the authority to destroy them? Anytime. Power under submission. He brought his authority and his power, surrendered and submitted just like his will to the Father to go to the cross. That is an example for each one of us. Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. He reminds them who's in power. And then in verse 55 through 56, look what he says. He says this, but Jesus, friend, why have you come? He says right here in verse 55, he says, In that hour Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber with a sword and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures and the prophets might be fulfilled. And look what it says in the last verse. Then all the disciples forsook him, and they all fled. Think about that. They all left him. These are the ones that saw every sign, every miracle for three years. And at the moment of his greatest need, they all bailed on him. Aren't you so glad that he doesn't do that to us? In the time that we need him the most, he doesn't leave us. In Job 19.19, 19, it says, All my close friends, they abhor me, and those whom I love have turned away from me or against me. In the book Absolute Surrender by Andrew Murray, and I highly suggest if you ever buy a new book, it's an old book that's in reprint. It's called Absolute Surrender by Andrew Murray. Look what it says. The condition for obtaining God's full blessing is absolute surrender to God. Forsake all, I ask you, say, to remember that the disciples were men who had forsaken all to follow Jesus. The Lord Jesus sent to a fisherman and said to a fisherman, leave your net behind and follow me. To another man, he said, leave your position as a tax collector and come follow me. And they did it. They left those things behind and followed Jesus. 
They later could say with the mouth of Peter that we have forsaken all and follow thee in Matthew chapter 19. They left their homes, their families, their goods, their names. Men mocked them and laughed at them. Men called them the disciples of Jesus. And when he despised and hated, they were hated alongside of him. They identified themselves with him and gave themselves up entirely to follow him. This is the first step in being filled with the Holy Spirit. We must forsake all to follow Christ. All these searchings and hungerings and longings that you have in your heart, I tell you that they are all the drawing of the divine magnet, Christ Jesus. He lived a life of absolute surrender. He has possession of you. He desires to live in your heart by his Holy Spirit. You have hindered and hindered him terribly. But he desires to help you to get a hold of him entirely. He comes and draws you now by his message and by his words. Will you not come and trust God to work in you that absolute surrender to himself? Yes, blessed be God. He can do it. He will do it. Here's the question. Will you allow him to do it? Who or what is holding you back tonight? Who or what is holding you back from fully surrendering your life to Jesus Christ? This is the real question that you're going to have to honestly answer yourself in the presence of God. This is it. Whatever it is, whoever it is, is it worth spending eternity separated from God? Because that's what it's going to cost you. There can be no victory without sacrifice. No sacrifice without surrender. No surrender without the understanding of God's love. And there can be no understanding of God's love without a right relationship with Jesus Christ. In other words, it's time to stop fighting, stop pushing, stop running, stop demanding your own will, stop doing your own thing, making your own decisions, walking in your own futile ways, planning your own life, and leaving God on the back burner. Those days are over. He's calling us, all of us, to absolute surrender, giving up everything. No more little gray areas of our life. No more things that we call a little weaknesses. No more pet sins. No more living in the shadows. No more living in doubt. No more living in fear. Walking into the light and saying, God, I surrender. Just as he did to the will of his father, he's desiring us to do the same here tonight. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you, and Lord, I pray if there was ever a message, Lord, I pray that you would continue to do that which you have started from the very beginning. Bring us to that place, Father God, of absolute brokenness and absolute surrender. That we would recognize it in all of our efforts, Lord God, to be good and to be Christian and to be right. None of it matters. There's no strength in it. Not without the power of your Holy Spirit. Not without the unction, Lord God. Not without the cleansing of the blood, Lord God. There can be no true Surrender. It is all through you, Lord God, and all we have to do is literally submit to your will. If you're here tonight, I don't know who's here. Just the Lord's put this on my heart. If you're here tonight and you have been fighting against God in so many different areas of your life, maybe one thing. If it's one thing, it's too many. God has been trying to get your attention. He's been trying to set you free. He's been trying to help you And you have been resistant. Your neck has been stiff like the Jews. And he's been wanting to do a brand new work in you, but he will not do it until you fully surrender your life. You may have accepted the Lord, but you're still living in your carnal ways. You're calling yourself a Christian, but you're living more for the things of the world and the flesh. And it's confusing you, and it's frustrating you because you're not seeing any movement. You're in what we call a rut. God is calling you home. He's asking you to lay down your arms, raise the white flag, and come home. And as we worship right now, if that is you, 
I'm going to ask you personally to come and join me at the front of the stage right now. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, now is the day of your salvation. Today is the day of your salvation. If you want to surrender to the Lord and want him to do a brand new work in your life, come forward and we'll pray together and we'll ask God to set us on a new path. This is the week to do it. This is the time. He's coming soon and we need to be right before the King of Kings. As we worship, you come and we will pray together as a family. Come.